um, just the CBCT part. And this is not this whole this whole sort of PowerPoint that is that's here. Um, it starts out with traditional. I'm just gonna flip through it because I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna touch on this in an upcoming lab. It will like in the next either next week or the week after. We're just gonna kind of review it together in lab. And I'm just gonna review like what is in a film and what what the layers are and how the image gets captured in a very brief, succinct way. Because like I said, this is just not stuff that's really covered. I don't think to any large degree on a national board, almost nobody uses these, but they are still out there. So you do have to talk about it a little bit. And then the film processing, like what actually happens. So we'll just review this in a lab. Um, coming up, film processing. So that's what's on this PowerPoint. Digital imaging, however, I probably have to figure out a, a way to talk about this in, in a little bit more um, depth. And I didn't think today was necessarily, although if we get done with like a half an hour to spare, I'm going to come back to this because there are a few things with digital radiography that I do want to make sure that um, so, that you know. At this point, you guys have been working with it in lab, so you know many things about it, but there's a few things about how the image is captured um, and and what the system is called that I just wanna talk about. There's two main different types of systems, and so I wanna just differentiate between them and talk about that. So we probably, we will come back to this at some point, um, but this is just going over different types of digital imaging, the enhancements, um, and the different kinds of fun little things you can do. So we will come back to these, um, but this is the um, three-dimensional digital or CBCT, um, which is not, I mean, I think it's been around for a while, but not a lot of general, uh, I think maybe more and more general offices might be using it, but really it's more for like specialty practices like oral maxo, like surgeons, maxillofacial surgeons, or periodontists, um, maybe maybe prosthodontists. I'm not sure if they would use one or not, but um, so it's it's going to be seen a little bit more in specialty practices than in a general gen, um, general practice. Endodontics, yeah, to see the, because basically what you're able to do is you're able to see these structures in three dimension. And so you're able to see like where the canals are gonna go or how much bone is on the facial or the lingual um, of, uh, of a ridge so that you, it helps with placement of implants and all these different things. So I was noticing also that chapter 26 discusses other types of extra oral images such as the transcranial or specialty images of the TMJ. So if you have the textbook, which you sh all should, I would just skim through the images on page 20, on chapter 26. You're not gonna get tested on them, but as a hygienist, it's a, I think it's a good thing to know that those types of radiographs are out there. Likely they won't be in a general practice. They might be in an orth, like an orthodontist might take it or a prosthodontist or you know, one of these yeah, other specialties. Or if, for... or if you work for a periodontist, they will likely take different specialty images. So it is, I think, good to just know that they're out there. So just peruse chapter 26, even if you're just looking at the pictures um, and the headings or subheadings. Um, okay, so CBCT, um, it's, I, I, I kind of went through it earlier today and sort of um, put in, a, rearranged a few things. And so did you just download it? I updated it in Moodle, gosh darn it. Um, always happen I swear the computer hates me and it's not this one because I saw it save it I even saw the little thing um okay let me let me get out of here real fast and look at Moodle is it the same slide I uh I rearranged the slides and then I added maybe one or two so hold on just a sec So week, we're on week nine, right? Mm -hmm. I just don't know why that happened. Let me see. Um, 
Okay, try it again. Sorry that you have to go out and come back in, but it, I think it will work now. I think it's because I, I didn't update Moodle. Like I updated it, but I didn't like refresh. So it should do it now. So this should be the first one? So yeah, so this, um, let me go back to, a, so that one where it has like the three, yeah. the three thing, um, that should be the first slide. I redownloaded it. It still didn't do it. I see it updated in um in my Moodle. Is anybody seeing it? Is anyone seeing the a different one? Um, uh, uh, fifty-seven. It is updated. Is it? Oh my God, Dad! Why does it do this? Let's see. So yeah, so this should be, so this should be thirty nine, slide thirty nine, and then there should be fifty seven total. Oh wait, so this is slide thirty nine. Yeah. It was slide forty. With the old one. Okay. It does, it does show that I have the right one in Moodle from my view, and I don't know if it just needs, but I needed to, like, um, I had saved it, but I needed to refresh, so I don't know if, if you go all the way out and come back in. So we are starting at 549. Yes, like for the last year. I got them. Yeah, it's weird because for me, like, on the bottom here, it says slide 39 of 57. So I'm assuming it's slide 39. I think we were confused about not starting from slide one. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought okay. that was slide one. <laughs> no. Okay. So this, so, so this is um, a PowerPoint that includes digital radiography, traditional film, and special imaging and they were just a it was just a lecture that all came together it all it just all came in one lecture but traditional film I'm going to talk about in lab and then the digital film like I said if we end up ending like a half an hour early I'm going to circle back and I'm going to go over the digital film because it's not going to take that long to talk about it but if we run long, you know, if we run long between doing the Kahoot and then talking about the live patient, then we're just going to save the digital portion. So that's basically all the content before slide 39. Does that, is everyone on the same page now? Yeah. So, and so, yeah, so from 39 on, it's just the, the, um, the different types of specialty images. Okay. Starting again. So in the notes, you should see chapter 26 to just peruse over 26. And then, so it's a um, technology that um, has become really desirable because it gives a really nice, accurate, detailed way to figure out what's happening. It's not, you know, when we take a pano or you take a, a traditional sort of intraoral film, you're looking at a 3D, you're looking at a 3D person, but your image is in two planes. It's only in two dimensions. So you lose a lot of, yeah, I am. <laughs> yeah. So you lose a lot of sort of perspective and, you know, a lot of things. So you can't really use it to figure out where to place something in somebody's mouth. So that's what's so nice about these 3D um, images is that it gives them that third dimension. Um, the CT scan, there's a software, they don't use, it doesn't use like a traditional film, there's no film, it does use radiation to expose the, the image, but then it, it, it creates the image and it shows it just on, a, just on, a, on the, on the computer. So it's a different type of technology than say a pano or an intraoral film, there's no like sensor specifically. Um, so uh, it's the CBCT stands for Cone Beam Computer Tomography. 
Um, and then it, what's also nice about it is it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So what you see on the uh, screen is a real good, it's a representation of the actual, what's happening, the size of the twos and the size of the structure. So there's lots of really cool things about it. You can also use it for things like to diagnose lesions, such as if there was like a tumor or a salivary gland, you know, stone or tumor or some other, you know, bone cancer, something happening. Um, and you can kind of see where it is and, and what the location is and everything. So there's lots of useful um, um, reasons to use a CBCT. And here, this image is just showing that in like a pano, the, it comes out in just a, like a beam, like a solid beam that just, um, it spreads out, but it's only in two dimensions, it's thin and wide. Whereas on the CBCT, it comes out like a cone. So it comes out and it spreads in all different directions. And so um, that helps to give the actual um, 3D image. There's something called the field of view, which is probably a term that you'll be tested on. There's not a lot, I'm not, I'm not gonna pull into detail a lot of stuff on quizzes and tests for this section. This is this is this falls very largely in a nice to know category, not a like have to know. So you know, I want you to know what are some things that you might use this for. This term field of view is important for you to know. And what you can see about it is that you can change the field of view. So you so this is also the amount of radiation that the patient's going to get. They can get a smaller amount of radiation if you're just going to do a small field of view, or you they can make it much larger and then they would get more radiation. Yeah. So the focal chalk would be the field of view for um... for this. Yeah. Focal chalk, field of view. I don't know if they're perfectly inner, but it's a similar concept at least. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's different ways that they um, can orient the image too. And so there's different planes. And so these are just demonstrating the different planes. So you can see there's an axle plane, which is a horizontal plane. It divides the anatomic features um, from superior, superior to inferior. So sort of like layers like this looking like top down, right? So it's like you're looking, you know, if you cut off the top of the head and look straight down and then you can think of like layers like that. So that's axial plane. Coronal is a vertical plane that divides the features from anterior to posterior. So it'd be coming like cutting off the front of, <laughs> it's a lovely way to describe things, but cutting like cutting off the front of the face and then going posterior. So you can see layers going back posterior. And then the last one is the sagittal plane, which is a vertical line that divides the anatomical features from left to right. So then you're going this way. So you're seeing it in this plane. Sagittal is this one. No, this one. This is the sagittal bottom. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that I'm going to test you on that either. That's kind of falls into the nice to know, I think. I think you have to know. Um, and this is just another um, way to see it. So you can see like the coronal, the axial, and the sagittal. So it just gives you, and it's just, you think about it in cross sections of those different planes. Um, so here's like an example of somebody in, standing, they, they look very similar to a pano. There's not, you know, there's variations in the, in the manufacturer, but it looks very sort of similar to a pano. Um, and these are some images and different planes that they may see. They might pick one image and then look at it from all different planes. And so you can see here, it's kind of hard to see, but what they're trying to do is kind of figure out the placement of an implant. And so they're looking at it from top down. They're looking at the bone from buccal to lingual. They're looking at the where the sinus is and so how much room they have. And then here's where they've actually decided. You can see, they can see where the nerve is, where the mandibular canal is and where the nerve runs, even though they're doing a maxillary implant, so it doesn't really matter. But still, if it was a mandibular, implant it would um it would matter so so just gives them all kinds of information that a doctor would want um before doing some kind of a procedure um here i think this is what is this saying is this like assist maybe what is that i don't know what that's 
showing. Sometimes I have no idea what they're trying to display, but it's just cool that you can see it in, clearly this is like a wisdom tooth close to the nerve, that I get. This, I'm not entirely sure what they're, unless it's a cyst. Sometimes cysts form around thir um, third molars, but it's incredibly helpful for um, a doctor who wants to see where the nerve is when they're thinking about extracting a third molar. So they don't want to get in there and nick the nerve or cause some kind of permanent or temp or kind of transient nerve damage. So it's really helpful for that reason as well. Um, so training most dentists who I just cut this out of the book because I thought this whole little paragraph was sort of nice to know. I remember Dr. Matsuda when I, I worked for him for years and he used to, um, I would hear him tell his patients, like, I can't, um, you know, just because I see something on your CBCT doesn't mean I can diagnose or talk to you about it. And he'd say, you're welcome to take this and bring it to a physician or a specialty of some other area and ask them about this or that. But he could only talk about what he was actually dealing with. So here it says, most dentists who use the CBCT imaging techniques do not have the formal training that's required to interpret the data because you can see all kinds of stuff on it and they just might not necessarily know how to interpret it or what they're looking at um, based on the anatomic areas beyond the maxilla and the mandible. Um, but someone like a maxillofacial surgeon, um, the American Academy of Oral Maxillofacial Radiology recommends that CBCT images be interpreted by somebody who can interpret the, the image. So that kind of makes sense. But so it's another reason why you wouldn't nece necessarily see them in general practices unless the general dentist likes to do implants and extract wisdom teeth, which they very well might like to or do root canals. I know that some general dentists love doing all that stuff, so. Um, okay, so we're nearing the end. See, it's a very short chapter, but this is just looking at some, this is just looking at some images and seeing like why they might, um, why they might use these images or what they might um, be trying to look for. So this is what type of image is this? Well, clearly it's a CDCT because that's what we're talking about right now. Um, did someone have a question? Oh, sorry. I thought someone had a question. And then what important information does this image show? So what, what do you think they were picking up here on this image? Yeah. Do you see that? A very strangely placed canine. So there, so there's a canine in a very particularly odd place. And so that's what they were using. This is they could actually, you go through the planes and then you can see where, where the tooth is or whatever structure you're looking for. So here's another um, image um, where they are just, so everything out of the field of view is, you can't see, so they move it into a plane where if they're just looking at a certain part of the anterior portion of the, um, of the face right through here, right through the, um, the chin area to see this canine, which looks massive. And these teeth look tiny. I don't, you know, there's, it's really yeah like obviously these are mandibular anteriors um and then this is a like a gigantic looking canine so I don't really understand the size of it all but that's that's what the image is um here again you can see um this is a really good example of how they would use the CBCT to place um an implant especially in the mandibular anterior where the bone is very thin there's not a lot of width there. And so they want to make sure that they place it at the most ideal angle so that they don't lose facial bone or lingual bone too, but more like facial, um, that they don't place it too far um, facial or too far lingually. So you can see that that's what they're doing now is just figuring out the, the right angle for this implant. So it's kind of interesting to see that. Mm -hmm, right. And they have different size implants, right? Like they can, they can do smaller or bigger implants depending on where they are, but they still don't have a lot of room to work with. Um, here's just a few more examples. So now we're at, that's all for CBCT. That's all there is. So you can see most of it's nice to know information. I think I would expect you to know things that you could use it for wisdom teeth, root canals, even though we didn't highlight it, but you did hear a classmate talk about root canals, but wisdom teeth, implants, those are big reasons why, you know, you should know that they're available, the field of view, and, um, and that it's sort of more of a 
specialty, although you may see it more and more. So, but those are some of the take home points that I would expect you to know about, um, about the, the 3D imaging. And then just to sort of quickly summarize some other types of images, this is a lateral cephalometric and you can see that there is a very large sensor. So this is not like a CBCT. This is more like a traditional extra oral film um, because there's this huge plate that you go up against and then they, so it's like having a chest x-ray or something like the, the film is behind you and the, they radiate in front. That's the same thing. Um, this is just one plane. It's a 2D image commonly used by orthodontists. Evaluate the, um, the growth patterns, trauma, if there was some trauma, and then developmental abnormalities. So and they may use this maybe before and after orthodontist. I'm not sure. I never worked for an orthodontist before, but um, that's the main someone who would mostly use it. Here's kind of a, um, a very up close image of the TMJ. Um, this is a TMJ tomographic rate um, image. And so this reveals bony details of the TMJ, the temporal mandibular joint, evaluation of, of any dysfunction in the joint, um, and then various views can be attained for evaluation. So this is again, just more of like a 2D image for um, see what's going on if somebody has like a joint problem or pain. Um, and here again is another, um, is another type of projection, transcranial TMJ projection. This is a lot harder to kind of differentiate. I am definitely not going to like test you on this. This is again, just sort of kind of more informational, but you can see that they're looking specifically for things like a lesion, uh, fractures, or tissue changes. So this is um, kind of dialing in much more detail for a transcranial TMJ projection. Tomographic method, let's see, x-ray beam directed down across the top of the temporal mandibular bone to the head of the condyle in the opposite side of the skull. So it's trying to zone right into that area to see what's going on right through nice here. To nice to know. You can just write it on the thing. This is a nice to know. You don't, I'm not gonna test you on this. And then another one could be an MRI. Somebody could go in for an MRI um, and um, no radiation for that. That's that magnetic. People get MRIs for lots of different reasons. Um, so that could be something that someone would go and have, um, again, maybe for temporal mandibular joint dysfunction or something like that, or um, to um, find out if there's some pathology somewhere. Um, so those are just other kinds of images that can happen in the head and neck region. And I think there's one more slide. Oh, and, and this is showing how the um, MRI might show up. So here you can see the condyle. Um, and then here it looks a little more kind of fleshy. I'm not sure how to read that one. That looks like a nose. <laughs> I don't know what that is. I'm not sure how to read that one. That's kind of interesting, but I can tell that that's the condyle, but I don't know. I don't know how to read this bottom one, but it is, you're not gonna be tested on it. So don't fret. If you're interested in this, you can look it up more on your own, but I've never heard a dentist one time say, you need to go get an MRI. So this is obviously something that probably happens in a much more, some people go to TMJ specialists. Maybe this is something they do. Um, so it's nice to know it's out there, but um, you're likely not going to see it very often in your practice. Okay, so I'm going to just put a pause on that and I'm going to switch gears and we're going to talk about the life patient experience. Yeah. They can, they can, they might not feel comfortable, um, but technically they can because they're teeth, they can extract all teeth, but if they're smart and they know that they don't want to mess with certain areas, they would put limits on themselves, but technically, yeah, they could, they could, yeah. Oh, I 
Oh, I know what I want to do. Hold on. Let me go to Oh, this from location to the phone. Mm, what's happening there? Just a big like an infection from number seven. Oh, from a root canal from a big no, it's abscess. Just, not even root canal, just a big abscess. Mm. And we let it go for like a year and a half. And you lost. And what's and amazing? But it probably did. You guys have one afterwards because it probably filled no, in. Yeah, we did quite a, well. We did the LPRS. We mm -hmm. draw the blood and make their own membrane. <gasps> the sticky bone and put it all in there. Oh. And, it and it came back really yeah. amazingly. That is, it's amazing how, what how much healing our bodies do. I know. Well, yes, that too. I showed them and started making more. Yeah, it's like a huge hole. It's like you got shot. Wow, that's amazing. Um. Okay. All right, I'm gonna um minimize this PowerPoint if I can figure out how to do it. Okay. Okay, so the live patient experience is coming up soon. It's coming up soon. So um, I want to go over all this stuff and put on your good listening ears so that you know all of this, all these little details. Because you just, I, the worst thing in the world is when you start to get close and then all of a sudden you're like, when you did tell us about X, Y, or Z, and it's like, we back about it and it's recorded. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you're like, I appreciate the checks because I'll be the first to not record it. So it's always check. Um, but yes, I see the recording button. Okay. So I, this, I haven't shared this one. I'm not going to share because it has the, um, this on it, which is outside my door. And I don't want that on a Google doc, but I am going to share this with you guys so that you um, have this information. So where are you? Why don't you guys me me for and don't edit it. It's I saved it as editor, but I should change that. <laughs> don't edit it. I'm going to change it to viewer. Okay. So you should be able to get that. So that gives you all the information that we're going to go over. So um, so uh, outside my door is the, is the sign up. So the first thing to know is that just because you're on a Monday doesn't mean you have to sign up for a Monday. You can sign up for a Wednesday or whatever. Well, it's only Monday and Wednesday. Those are the only two days. So the times are going to be, the times are going to, oh, it's not on that. It's over here. The times are going to be, um, note the earlier start. And so you have essentially two hours to take an FMX, but I give two and a half hours because medical history almost always takes a half an hour. Now, if you're bringing in your boyfriend, your husband, or your best friend or whatever, do a lot of that stuff before you come in, like do the medical history, um, like ahead of time. And so that all you have to do is like go over it with me or Teresa and then take vitals. Like that's all you need to take blood pressure and, um, temperature and pulse and what else that's it is that it um yeah you can i think 
you I'm trying to remember what the rule for that you have to ha you have to need it so it has to be more than three years Does that include PANA? and um I don't know that it has to include a piano. I think if it's if it, if it's a piano, we can let maybe let that slide. But I'm trying to remember why or why not you couldn't take it on each other. But what I do know is if you um, is everyone listening? What I do know is that if you have a hard time finding a patient, the front office has a few patients, so they will be able to um, help you get a patient if you have a hard time if you don't have a lot of friends or family in the area. So, mm -hmm. so the, I'm not doing very good going down the line, but <laughs> but they, they have to be your next patient. So you can't just bring in someone that sounds fun to take an FMX on and then not give them that caveat they need to be now I realize that you're going to bring in somebody someone's going to bring in somebody who doesn't fit your criteria because say they have bad perio like they're, maybe they're more advanced perio and so you end up not being able to see them for your first patient next semester but the 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 goal is is to have it be the first patient so that is like the criteria and then obviously there's going to be a few exceptions something will happen where something will happen but you, that's your goal is to say, you're committing for this FMX, but you're also committing to come in and be my first patient in spring. So you, that's the expectation you put on your patient too. So um, mm -hmm. for just so we know, because some of us on family doesn't, the senior senior doesn't have to get something. Yeah. So um, how long would be disappointment and how long would be appointment like? So in spring, you guys are going to, you're going to be the slowest that you'll ever be. You'll only get better from there, right? So it's, it's only up from there, but you will, you will very likely take uh, the whole three and a half hours or whatever you're to do assessments. And you might not even get done with assessment. So your FMX will be out of the way. That's great news, but you still will have all the assessments and a dental exam. And likely that will for sure take the first one and sometimes people don't even get done with assessment. So then you know like, okay, the next appointment, we have to finish up assessments, we have to get them all checked off, um, we have to get the dental exam, then we have to plan all the procedures. And so that sometimes can even be the next appointment. And so sometimes on your third appointment, you get to start cleaning. Oh. So, go ahead, yeah. So it can be like, it is a good idea to tell your patients that family, that they may be con committing to up to three to four appointments in the beginning. Um, and the clinics are like, what, three to four hours? It can take that long. Yeah. Like a prophy? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it would usually be one thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and this is, this is like the longest, right? There will be some people who do it in less, but you have to give people that expectation that it, it is not going to, you're not, they're not going to come in and get their teeth cleaned in one appointment. There's no way that's going to happen. <laughs> Um, it, yeah, it would depend on how you schedule them. Oh, it would depend on how you schedule them. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, can you just go? No, no, no. You could have them for the morning and the afternoon. Okay. You could do that, right? Yeah. Yeah, you could do that. You could have, if you, don't you have all day clinics? No, no, not right now. That's not for spring. That's senior, huh? Yeah. All day clinic. Okay, no, you can't do it all day long. Maybe on a Monday and a Wednesday. What time of day? It's probably morning. And just the renovated. No, Monday or Wednesday. Yeah, Monday or Wednesday. You guys, we're not talking about radiology patients. We're talking about clinic patients. We have gone off. <laughs> We've gone off. I have to rein you back in. Come back to radiology. <laughs> It is. It will be the same patient. Um, okay, let's go back to the list here. 
We're going back to number one. What was number one? Patient does not have to be vaccinated. <laughs> These are things you might want to know. Your patient does not have to be vaccinated. Um, if they agree to be your patient for the FMX, they must agree to be your clinic patient in the spring. So whether or not you actually end up seeing them, of course, is a slight unknown, but they must at least agree to it. So they must be ready to sign up for the whole kit and caboodle. Um, must have been three years since their last FMX. If it's like 2.8 years, I fine. It, but, you know, people start whittling it down more and more. And they're like, no, oh, it was like a year and a half ago. And, you know, it's like, just really try to shoot for that. And the other thing I will say is that if they're paying out of pocket, if they're paying out of pocket and say, say they, the last place they went was out of state, like don't ask, don't tell is not a bad policy. Like if you come to me and say, you know, like, if you come to me and say, you know, my significant other or my family member has a dentist in this other, and it's been like two years, just, but they're coming and they want to be your patient and they want to participate. There's like a wee bit of a gray area, but just don't ask too many questions and it'll all be fine. I have, okay. I have a question. When, when is it? In uh, end of November, beginning of December. So, but, but. If you're asking me, it's a three year, okay? Three years, if you're asking me. So they have to pay for the x-rays? They do, they have to pay for the x-rays and they also have to pay to be your patient. Yeah. So they, it's not super expensive, but you do want to tell them about the cost as well. There is cost to it. So that's important to know as well. Um, no, that you don't, I don't think you get a discount. Do you think? Um, I do not know about that. I don't know about a lower fee schedule. I, I, I would assume that uh, Sarah would have corrected this because it's fifty dollars for um, for so and I would have thought she would have told me if it was less than fifty dollars if it was a family. So I don't think that's true, but we can we can double check it. So try and stick to this three year mark. We, if we're treating them like real patients, we're not going to take an FMX sooner than three years. But I know everyone always gets it like, it's in my family and they want to help me. So, but try and do that the best you can. Yeah. There is a little information here on insurance. So they do take insurance. And I know it's a little, it's a little confusing, but um so we will follow clinic protocol and send all new patient paperwork to patients via DocuSign prior to the appointment. So you have to put in the patient's, you have to give Sarah the, the patient's information so she can send it all through DocuSign and they'll get it set up as a new patient in the clinic so that you can go into Axiom and open up a medical history and all the official stuff. But Sarah has to be able to have them be like a, a new patient to the clinic. You can, yeah, you can send over. If they're going to be an existing patient, really, they would want dental. You don't have to have them sent over like right away, but by the time spring comes and there's a dental, um, a dental exam, it's nice to have them. If if they have a new FMX and there's nothing like kind of crazy going on, they're probably not going to feel like they have to see old dental records. So it's sort of like you can still, they can still be seen, but you could send over stuff. That's, you know, that's fine. Yeah. I don't think they're like going to require it if the patient, so you guys will have patients that won't want to have x-rays and they'll say, I just had films done and I'm going to send over my films. And in that case, that you have to have those films or else the dentist will say, no, we have to take our own films here. We so, so I, I feel like that's another kind of like it, if somebody has, because I think they only take MODA, there's a limited Oregon health plan. So if you have a family or friend that has Oregon health plan and they are willing to pay out of pocket, just don't even bring up insurance. 
just if they're willing to pay $50 out of pocket, they can just sign up as uninsured. Because I think if they, and that is a, I just, that's another kind of hairy part. Whereas I feel like it, it, it just don't talk about that. Very much. <laughs> because I'm not trying to get people to be, I think honesty is very important, but it's, it's, it is one of these gray areas where I think that Oregon Health Plan wants you to use Oregon Health Plan. And I don't understand it fully, but I think that if somebody, our clinic can only accept certain, certain Oregon Health Plan insurances, and it's almost like we can't market ourselves to do something it's an insurance thing that's all i can tell you it comes down to some kind of an insurance thing that i don't totally understand but i do think that if your if your family or friend wants to come in and see you they can pay out of pocket they don't have to declare they have insurance i just don't think they want to talk too much about it because they don't want to i don't know it's something to do with oregon health plan and it's just better not to talk about it <laughs> It's, I'm making it sound worse than I'm sure it really is, but the cleaning, I believe, is um, the cleaning is it's uh, fifty dollars. It's in the mm -hmm. yeah, yes. I think it's about I think it's about fifty dollars. Yes, I think it's about fifty. It's not though because like if we're gonna have to. Yeah. No, no, no. That's a good question. So you guys about the cleanings and the appointments, you're just charging like if it's perio maintenance at 75, it, even if you saw that patient six times, it'd be $75. If you do a, a profi and it's say it's 50, whatever it ends up being. If you see that patient three times, it's fifty dollars. So it's not per visit; it's one, one thing. So mm -hmm. For example, say that you got an FMX and a clinic all one day. You just add a price for each of them, and that'll be the flat fee for the rest of their treatment. Correct. Yes, they when they do the treatment plan, when you set up your treatment plan, they sign it, and whatever that total is, you know, is, ends up being then they don't have to pay more than that for anything else that whatever you do. That's why it's important you do like the, you don't forget to do the fluoride varnish and all these little things that even though it's only like $5, you don't want to like forget it and then go, oh, I'm just going to add it. Cause you, the patient agreed to a certain amount of money and you don't want to like add to it without them agreeing. So um, if you guys are, if you guys are really, concerned or question that um insurance thing bring ask Brendan and sarah they'll tell you i just know that there's something kind of funny there so because what is it where did you see the thing where it said that lacy no the thing about oregon health plan uh, it's higher higher up. Higher up. Oh, about the 50 dollars Oh, you will not be able to see your patient if they just, oh, if they disclose, see, just don't let them disclose it. <laughs> so I think that's trying, they're just trying to tell you there, just like, just don't have them disclose. <laughs> and it's fine. Okay. So um, front office will verify insurance prior to, to um, the appointment. So that's where you'll just either have your patient say, I'm just going to do no insurance, pay out of pocket, or this is my insurance. So that's just trying to give you some practical information um, beforehand. Straight out of pocket fee is $50 once the patient enters the building. So here are some details, which I know this will feel kind of irrelevant to you at the moment, but I want you to know that this is that you need to know this day of. So um, this is talking about um, what it looks like in Axiom. So um, once the patient enters the building, you'll get a notification in your messenger in Axiom. It turns red and that tells you that your patient is, is here, but it doesn't mean that they're ready to go get them yet. You have to wait for this green ready because the patient will come in and then uh, Sarah and Brenda will do, you know, their center, their, the protocol that they'll do with the patient in the front. So they'll say, well, they're here, but they're not ready. And then when it turns green, then they're ready and you can go get them. 
Um, so this is, and then once you get your patient in the back, you have to seat patient. And that's something you like actually do in Axiom. You do patient seated. Um, and we'll all, um, Teresa and I will show you guys how to do that. It's just a drop down. Um, Medical, it says medical and dental history, but honestly, we don't actually really do dental history because um, we've just done medical. So you'll do your, that I should probably just take that out, but you do your dental history when you do your other assessments when they come back in the spring. You can ask them stuff like, when was the last time you went to the dentist? Do you have any teeth that are hurting? You know, things like that. But the full dental history, you're not going to do. Um, after your FMX is taken, you and the instructor in will determine whether or not they do fit well for a first patient. If their perio is is too um, is advanced, you're not going to you're not going to be comfortable doing their cleaning in the spring. So then we you can either save them for your senior year, um, or you can give them to a senior and have a, a senior clean their tooth, um, which they would happily take. So here's my here's my family member. Um, so we'll talk about that after the, after we finish the FMX, um, and then we'll, um, do that part. And then we walk your patient up front and then you'll come back and you'll clean the room and then you're good to go. Um, so this is the information though. So when you go in here, like print this off or copy and paste this onto another sheet, um, um, so that you can write down this information and give this information to Sarah and Brenda. And then these are the times. So like I was saying earlier, you can, if you, uh, if you're on a Monday, but you, your family or friend or whoever um, would rather come in on a Wednesday, that's fine. It's first come first serve, but you have to uh, get them like committed. Like you can't just hold a space. Be like, I'm going to talk to them later and figure it out. You have to get them committed to that time before you sign up. Um, and so it, it needs to be like, I know for sure they're coming in and that's why I do a hard copy is because in last year I did a Google doc and people were constantly changing. They would go in and take their name off one place and put it on another time. And Sarah and Brenda make a schedule and they put you in the schedule. So it's not like fluid. It's not like you can be like, I switch. I want to come in at two 30 instead of 1230. Like you're in the schedule. So you can change if something happens, like some kind of a circumstance happens where you have to, but you have to talk to me and you have to, and we have to change it with Sarah and Brenda. Um, we can't just like change it on paper. It has to be changed in the scheduler. Um, and we, and so the half an hour here, the 1230 start time is so that you have a half an hour to get vitals and get your patient situated. And then you have two full hours from one to three to take the FMX. Um, and then, so 2.30 to 3, you'll be doing, again, vitals and your medical history. And then from, um, where are, well, and then from 3 to 5 is when you'll do the FMX. And so that's how the um, timing will go. And we're just starting earlier because Mondays and Wednesdays, we run into a senior night clinic. And there's just no way that we, I mean, in lab, we finish up, you know, when the, like the senior patients are coming in at six, we, but there's just, we just can't do that with live patients because every year somebody kind of runs over a little bit and we just cannot run into six, even 5.30. So we're gonna just bump it up and start a little bit earlier. So just note those time changes. So that week, um, we don't have like lab. Time. So we don't have lab, okay. yes, thank you. Um, actually, that's another good point. So week 14 and 15, you don't have your regular lab. There's no labs for the last two weeks. So you're going to schedule when? So this schedule is outside my door right now. So you can, <laughs> as Lacey said, so you can go out there if you have somebody that you like, if it's like your significant other and you know they're coming in when you say they come in. But if you're just guessing, wait until you confirm it with your family or friends or whoever. Um, and then what other questions do you guys have? Um, so we were uh, starting setting up like 12 or 2. Yes. Yeah, so, so the, but the people who start out at 1230, you, you can start setting up and you can do your medical history in, 
in your operatory of, of, and remember there's no Dexters, so it doesn't matter which room, like there's not a good room or a bad room, although some of you might not like that first room, but they're all pretty much the same, but it's first come whichever room you want, first come first serve. And you can start setting up at 1230, bring your patient in um, and seat them in the radiology room and do medical history and vitals. If you're the second group, if you come in at 2.30, I'll have a few designated spots where you can bring your patient in and do medical history and vitals and everything like in a designated spot because likely someone may still be in the operatories taking films. Not necessarily everybody, there's, you know, but there's going to be a little bit of a kind of overlap. And so... Um, so that's how that'll work. So if you come in in the first group, you'll just go right into an operatory. If you come in in the second group, then you're going to have to um, have another spot to do your vitals and stuff. Unless someone finishes fast and then the rooms are open, we'll just play it by ear. But it's a really fun, it's fun. It's your first patient experience. It always goes really well. And I'm going to repeat this. Um, I see your hand right now. Just two seconds. Um, I'm going to repeat this, but there when you take, you start out with your bite wings and you take your bite wings first and try your darndest to open up your contacts. And um, if you take one bite wing and your contacts are closed and you take the next bite wing and your contacts are closed, actually, no, you take your first bite wing and your contacts are closed, get myself or Teresa. And then when you move up to the PAs, if you take your first PA and you've cut off the apices or you haven't gone back posterior enough, get myself or Teresa. We want to be there to like help you through the whole thing. We don't want you to end up with nine retakes. So we want to like literally help you through the whole process so that it's good for you and for your patient. So Ryan. Yeah. Uh, that I someone else asked that and I don't know if that's I do know okay I'm starting to remember a few things I know that you guys sit as each other's patients at one point next semester so I feel like either the answer and I'm gonna have to check with Professor Ahmed honestly either the answer is no because you guys see each other next because you guys do pair up and clean each other's teeth um or the answer is yes because for that same reason so I'm actually but la the last two years nobody's ever sat for each other so I feel like the answer is no but I can't remember the rationale behind it and I think it's because they it if I'm trying I'm trying to scrounge my memory for why that answer would have been no and I think it's because they really want you to pull fresh blood in and give yourself an experience. They don't want you to just rely on your students because you guys will end up being each other's patients anyways. Like you count, they do count that as one of your patients. So I feel like they really want you to get like somebody. And if you don't have a friend, family, whatever in the area, they have clinic patients that are, they have like two or three people like that want an FMX and they need someone to take an FMX. And so they will give you one of those over, I think one of your classmates. I'm going to double check with Professor Ahmed, but I'm pretty sure the answer is no to that. But I'd have to double check. Any other questions? Did you have another question? Is that okay? So I can't think of anything else. Yes. So if our partner, or I mean, um, the patient, mm -hmm. uh, comes in and they need the X. Mm -hmm. that we be able to tell if they aren't in a very yes yes so we will look at it and because we're going to do carries and in, um we're going to do carries interpretation and perio interpretation um next week or the week after not next week the week after and so um we will look at that and if we think that if we see radiographic calculus with bone loss then very likely we're going to say, we might save this person. If we see radiographic calculus in a few areas, but no bone loss, we'll be like, Woo that's a good one. But if we see bone loss, we're probably going to wait and have you wait until um, senior year. Cause it's just, you just can't tackle all these new things. I mean, the calculus alone is going to be like, Whoa! it's going to blow your mind, which it'll be fun though. Super duper fun. But if you have a deep pocket, you're not going to, it's just not going to be. 
But some people will see some perio toward the end of their um, spring junior year. And we've had students see like pretty, pretty hard perio and they just felt like they were thrown into the deep end toward the end. So it's not unheard of, but usually we try to ease you guys into like a little bit like calculus on a prophy is fun and it's a good place to start because you have something to remove, you know, you have something to do. Um, okay, let's do this. We have like a few minutes left. So I don't know, this is the, this is the Kahoot to, um, to practice. And I edited it a little bit. Oh, don't look at it yet. Wait, hold on. Don't look at the right answers. I have to, hold on. Um, Okay. Is there why? Fights? Like arguments? For, I don't think so. I've never seen a fight. Like a boyfriend? I've never seen, I mean, I saw it last year. Like, yeah, bickering. I've seen so last year one of the seniors brought her boyfriend in several times and he was always super polite, but um he, sometimes he seemed a little grumpy. I've so, never heard him in Yeah. Like no, I see lots of I, I there's lots of friends and family and boyfriends and girlfriends that come in, but um I don't ever see fights. But I definitely see like you know, pe people can get weary of the long appointments. Let's just yeah, put it that way. And family members can be the worst because they know you and they're like, can we just like hurry this up? It's like, no, we have a process. And so sometimes people, really people sometimes think, oh, family will be so much easier, but there are pros and cons to bringing in family. You know, when it's a clinic patient, they, there is that detachment, you know, they don't feel so you know, entitled to ask you like to hurry up and, and come in late. Oh, if, you know, I can't make it till nine. Is that okay? Yeah. That's not going to fly. And so they, they really want, I mean, that's the thing family members do tend to do. They're like, well, I just can't make it there until, you know, eight 30 or nine. And it's like, no, nope, you're going to be here at, cause we start at, you know, clinic starts when it starts. And so there are pros and cons to bringing in people that, you know, um, okay. You guys, Okay, let's do this. So you guys have to go to Kahoot. Either you have the app or you go to Kahoot dot, um, dot IT. And I'm sorry if these pictures are horrible and the arrows are horrible. This is all for me. We only have like eight minutes to do this. Okay, so um, I the, the tally for who signed up here. So I know sometimes it kicks you off. It kind of does funny things. But um, I'll start it after I see, uh, you know, hopefully roughly 32 of you. Yeah. 
Why is Lisa sad? Why is Lisa sad? Okay, twenty seven, twenty eight, twenty nine, twenty nine. Why is it doing that? No more, no more, 30. I know sometimes I've had problems doing this where it's kicked people out and then they have to go back in. Come on, come on, come on. I don't know who's missing. Okay, should I start or is someone still 31? Oh, Irene's gone. Okay, so we got it. Okay, we're here. We're all here. Okay, start. Here we go. This it is a competition. There is. I didn't. I'll bring a prize next week. I forgot prizes. So name the radio peak structure that the arrow is pointing to. Name the radio peak structure that the arrow is pointing to. <laughs> good the external oblique ridge good job so that's this is the external oblique ridge right through here good job okay next i'm gonna speed through the little like this part because i'm afraid we're not gonna have time so number two name the radio lucent area that the arrow is pointing to so you can kind of think of it like this what's this area that it wants you to look at. I know this is not, I know it's not ideal. There's not a way to make the picture bigger. Good, good submandibular fossa. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Name the radio opaque area that the arrow is pointing to. So now we're looking at this. Looking at this. Good maxillary tuberosity. Okay, name the radiolucent structure that the blue arrow, so ignore the little black one, what's the blue arrow pointing to? Good, maxillary sinus, very good. The other one was kind of pointing to the inverted Y. Woo. I love that little emoji. Um, okay, name the radiolucent structure the arrows are pointing to. The image is upside down. Couldn't figure out how to turn it around. So what's the radiolucent? What's the radiolucent structure? Oh. 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 That the that the green arrows ignore these arrows. That's the suture. So I, that one was hard because it was not a great picture, but that's the median palatine suture. Name the radio peak structure the arrows are pointing to. So now we're up here. We're looking at this. I know it's kind of light and small, but we're looking right through here. Radiopaque. So if it's radiopaque, then what is it probably pointing to? Like what kind of a structure? Uh, 
So if it's the if it's the bone, so if it's the floor of the maxillary sinus, it's going to be radiopaque. If it's the cavity, it'll be radiolucent. Oh. Name the radiolucent structure the arrow is pointing to. Mandibular fossa. Yeah. Mental fossa? Mental fossa? <laughs> oh, now I'm confused. Did I put the wrong one? No. Is it the mental fossa? I got points Now I gotta go check that. Is it the mental fossa? No, no. Yeah, that's the that's but that's no, no the, the, <laughs> it is the mental fossa. This is the mental foramen. Yeah, oh my gosh. This, yeah. this is the mental foramen is where the nerve comes out, and then the mental fossa is that just the thinner part of bone. But did I cute? Did I cue no, it right? right? I did it right. Okay. I just was confusing myself. Okay. Name the radiopaque structure that the red arrow is pointing to. So now, so notice where the, the teeth that it's notice the teeth that's underneath this structure here. I don't like this game. I don't like this game. The floor of the nasal fossa. So if it's anterior teeth below, then it's the nasal fossa. If it's premolars, it's the maxillary sinus. Okay. Name the radio peak structure. Okay, so now we're looking at this thing. What's this thing? This thing. The zygomatic process. Zygomatic process. I'm hurrying. So we got five more left and we're pretty much out of time. So I'm trying to hurry. name the um okay, so what's this? This is the radio cake structure. And this might be named, I was thinking, oh man, we might have talked about it as a different name as well there's two there's two names that this can be <laughs> yeah sigmoid or it can be called the mandibular notch or the sigmoid notch yeah. okay name the radiolucent area that the arrows are pointing to so what it's kind of say notice how it's sort of sandwiching an area and it's radiolucent all of them are air spaces, so I guess you've got to know it's an air space. So nasopharyngeal, so nasopharyngeal is like on the sides and then oropharyngeal is down a little bit lower. And then the palatoglossal is the one above the maxillary teeth. Okay. Oh, must have hit the name the pointy radiograph structure, the arrow. So this is hard to see. I realize this is, but it's pointy. It's kind of in this area. See how it's kind of sandwiching it over over in this area. It'd be over here as well. Pointy. Yeah. Trying to give some some clues. It would be more visible. Styloid process. Good job. Styloid process. It'll be more um, clear on the exam soft. If that, if that is on the structure, uh, name the radiolucent structure that the arrow is pointing to. Notice it's kind of sandwiching in a spot. I know you can't really see it. You'll see it better on the exam soft thing, but mandibular canal. So it's kind of, it's all along. If it does on the exam, it'll show like many arrows on both sides. So it'll sort of sandwich it in. So you should clearly know what it's pointing to. I know it's hard to see on this. This is not ideal. Um, name the radio cake structure that this um, the arrows are pointing to. I need one more. Or maybe this 
The hard palate, good. Maybe that was the last one. Was it the last one? One more. Name the radio opaque structure the arrow is pointing to. Radio opaque. Nasal septum. Good job. Okay, let's see who won. And it's also speed, you know, Tammy, number three, yay. Number two, V, good job, V. And good job. Okay. Yeah, <laughs>